Hello CrossFit youth, welcome to another Wednesday night cross training. I'm glad that you could join me again tonight. You know, I really appreciate those of you who are watching these videos and growing in your relationship with Christ and studying the Word of God together um, to uh, make your life better in Christ and to be better examples to the people that are, that are around you. I really appreciate your dedication, even though we're, you know, not meeting in person at the church in the youth building right now. I appreciate your dedication to the study of the Word of God that we're doing together on Wednesday nights uh, through this camera. So uh, again, you know, can't wait till we can get back together in person. Uh, don't forget, we have started uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night services in the sanctuary again. Um, we are practicing social, social distancing uh, while we're there, but uh, we're meeting and uh, we're worshiping the Lord together in song and in word. Uh, so invite, I invite every one of y'all to attend, 10-15 uh, on Sunday mornings, uh, 6 o'clock on Sunday nights, and 7 o'clock on Wednesday nights. So I've uh, uh, been seeing some of y'all there. I appreciate y'all. Uh, being faithful in attendance to church, and uh, I want to invite the rest of you to take part in that as well. Uh, well, tonight <clears throat> we're going to do the second lesson that we uh, started the series last week called Forever Filthy Rich, and it's a study through uh, the first three chapters of Ephesians, and it's a really great study. Um, last week's lesson in, in the Word of Life material was written very well, in my opinion, and uh, uh, this uh, lesson uh, is no exception to that um, that we're going to go over tonight too. So uh, looking forward to teaching this. If you'll get your Bibles, um, turn to the book of Ephesians. It's in the New Testament and we're going to be in chapter 2 tonight. And uh, we're going to read, um, I believe, uh, verses 1 through 10. So while you're getting your Bibles, I want to ask you a question. Do you know what the three most famous paintings are in the world? The three most famous paintings in the world. I know that most of you are probably thinking of one particular one. And uh, we'll, we may talk about that one that you thought about here in just a minute. But um, if you got your Bibles, we'll go ahead and start the lesson. Um, first, I want to tell you that the third most famous picture in the world is The Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci. The world famous painting is not shown in a, in a museum, though, but it covers the back of a wall in the dining hall of a monastery in Milan, Italy. It was painted by the most famous artist of all time, Leonardo da Vinci. In the late 15th century is when he painted this. The painting depicts the scene of the Last Supper of Jesus with his disciples, as you know by the name. All of you have seen this painting. We, there's a lot of people. I have a, a little plaque of it uh, in my house. A lot of people have a, either a painting or a plaque or something of that um, in their house. But the second most famous painting in the world is Starry Night by Vincent Van Gogh. All of y'all have heard his name. Now, when I saw the title of, of this painting, I didn't remember what it looked like. I knew I'd heard of it, so I, I Googled it, and I looked at it. It's a beautiful, beautiful painting. This uh, painting was painted in 1889. It depicts the view from his room at the sanitarium where he lived at the time. It was uh, placed in the Museum of Modern Art in New York in 1941, and you can see it there uh, this day. But the number one most famous painting in the world is the portrait Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci. That's probably the one you thought of. The most fainting, uh, famous painting in the world is the main attraction at the Louvre Museum in Paris, where it is seen by six million people every year. Leonardo da Vinci painted it somewhere between the year 1503 to 1504 and worked on it until he died in 1519. At one point, the painting was valued at roughly $800 million. $800 million for the painting Mona Lisa. It is by far the most famous and most valued portrait of all time. However, it is still not the greatest portrait for you to look upon. The greatest portrait for you to look upon is 
painted by the Apostle Paul. Not using paint and brushes, but by using the words inspired by God himself. You can go to the Louvre and gaze at the Mona Lisa, but see, it won't change your life. However, you can gaze at the great portrait of salvation and your life will never be the same. It will change you. You will discover tonight by gazing into that portrait, and this is our sticky statement, that you are born broken, but not forsaken. So let's gaze at this portrait of salvation found in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Now, when we go through this, uh, we're going to have three main topics in this lesson, and I want, to, I want you to think about colors. Um, there's going to be three colors, black, red, and green. And this is why I've set up my iPad the way I have to record this. I've got this black curtain behind me. I've got this red shirt on, CrossFit Youth, and this green wall behind me. Now, it may not look really green on, on the video, I don't know, but it, it's green. So just kind of uh, picture that in your mind. So the first color reminds us of darkness, and we're talking about black. And darkness and black, in this lesson, represents man's sinfulness, okay, man's sinfulness. So Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 3 gives us a description of fallen man. And I'm going to get out my Bible.is app here. And we're going to um, read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. And it says, this is uh, the Apostle Paul writing, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now in work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So every person, when we read that scripture, we see that every person that is alive is born dead. Every person alive is born dead, spiritually dead, in sin. We are all born sinners, and therefore, we all sin. Uh, there is no spiritual life in any of us when we're born. Romans 5.12 says that because of Adam's sin, sin has been passed down on all of us so that we were born sinners. Uh, verse 2 says that sinners walk according to the course of this world and according to the prince of the power of the air. Okay, that's Satan, by the way. Both of these work in the children of disobedience, and that's what we were before we came to faith in Christ. We were children of disobedience. Basically, Paul is stating here that there is a worldwide philosophy of life that is driven by Satan himself and that all sinners are subject to his rule. Thus, they live in dis disobedience to God's rule. This entire world is and always has been driven by uh, three philosophies of life that are rooted in man's depravity. Humanism, materialism, and hedonism. Now, you may have heard those terms. You may have not have heard the word hedonism before. You've probably heard of materialism and humanism. So uh, let's talk about those just a minute and find out what they are. So humanism, first of all, is the worship and the exaltation of man. Okay, It's a self-exaltation in which we all desire to exalt ourselves or sometimes maybe brag on ourselves or, or think highly of ourselves. We all desire to make ourselves look better than we really know that we are, don't we? We all have a tendency to do that on some level, some, some more than others, but on some level we all try to, you know, we make excuses for ourselves, don't we, a lot of times. That's, that's a form of humanism. Um, but that is rooted in pride, okay? So humanism. All right, the second is materialism. Okay, materialism is the worship of things. And sometimes 
uh, we don't realize that we're worshiping things, but that's really what we're doing. So it's really pursuing um, the longing for self-indulgence. It's a gimme, gimme, gimme. Uh, more, more, more. It, it kind of uh, makes me think about the seagulls in Finding Nemo. You know, mine, 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 and they're all fighting over it because they want it. They say it's mine, mine, mine. It's, it's materialism. It's, it's the pursuing of and the longing for self-indulgence. Give me, give me, give me. Your possessions can be become more important than your friendships, than your family. Because, see, we, we, we have this idea of life that we've got to be successful, and, and we ought to try to be successful, but a lot of times that becomes our main goal. Our, our main objective of life is to be successful in life and to have nice things, a nice house and nice vehicles and, and uh, side-by-sides and, and toys and boats and four-wheelers and, you know, everything that we can get our hands on, nice yards, big yards and big houses and, and plenty of money in our pocket, you know, to buy the things that we want. We get so focused on our money and we end up a lot of times fighting over our money, whether it's fighting with our employers or fighting with our family. You know, that's the number one reason that uh, married people get divorced is because of money and fighting over money. Sometimes uh, they may um, fall into working so much that they don't have time to spend with their family. Like they're they got in their mind they're working for their family and to make their family's life better, but it winds up destroying their family because that's everything that they're focused on. They're focused on working and making more money and getting more things and nicer things, and a lot of times it destroys people's lives. That's materialism, the worship of things. People pursue what please them even at the expense of it hurting others. Uh, this is hedonism. And hedonism is driven by self-gratification. Okay, Hedonism is rampant in society. There's a lack of morality and simple understanding of right and wrong because people want to please themselves. It, it's like when you think about the different laws of society and the different rules of society, you know, it's like people think that, that these rules and laws ought to apply to everybody else but not them. And why do they feel that way? Because of self-gratification. Because they're looking out for number one. You, have you heard that before? I'm looking out for number one. And, and they're always on the defense, uh, in, in defense of their rights. Like, I know my rights. You know, that sort of thing. You, you hear that a lot now on social media. I know my rights. Well, it's because they don't want to obey the laws of the land and the rules of community because they want to do what they want and they don't have to answer to anybody else. It's self-gratification. By nature, we desire to fulfill the lust of our flesh and our mind. Um, how many of you have ever experienced the wrath of your parents, your mom or your dad? when you did something that they didn't want you to do. You experienced the wrath of mama and daddy. It's no fun being under the wrath of your parents, is it? Well, as sinful fallen man, we all fall under the wrath of God when we live in these three categories, humanism, materialism, and hedonism. But there's good news. There's hope. Because you're born broken, but you're not forsaken. Sticky statement. You're born broken, but not forsaken. There is a second color, red. Okay? The color red represents the compassion of a loving God. We each must understand our own sinfulness before we can begin to comprehend God's loving compassion. Okay? So that's a very important aspect of salvation that, that many try to leave out today. They, they try to leave out the fact that we have to first realize that we're sinners and against God. We're living our lives 
completely for ourselves and not for God, and that we need him as a savior because of that. But let's talk about God's compassion. Um, and we're going to be uh, starting at verse 4 next. <clears throat> Paul begins this next sec section of verses with two words, but God. In the midst of our dark, fallen, and sinful condition, God reached down and showed us his love. His love is best understood through his mercy, his grace, and his gift of salvation. Okay, so let's talk about the mercy of God. Let's, let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. Get back into my Bible.is app. Okay, verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Okay, here in verse 4, the Apostle Paul describes God as rich in mercy. And what is mercy? Mercy is God withholding from us what we deserve. So how many of you ever um, have deserved a punishment that was withheld from you by someone in authority? So you, you did something wrong and you deserve to be punished for it because those were the consequences that you knew would come if you did that. But for whatever reason, that authority over you showed mercy toward you and you didn't have to take that punishment. The reality was that you did deserve to be punished, but for whatever reason, someone decided to show you mercy. Remember, you deserve God's wrath. I deserve God's wrath because of my sinfulness. But God, who is rich in mercy, decided to withhold our punishment and give us an opportunity to ask for forgiveness. Thank God that you are born broken. I was born broken, but we are not forsaken. But God is not only rich in mercy, but he's also rich in grace. Let's talk about the grace of God. Okay, I'm going to start back at verse 4 so that it has kind of a flow, and we're going to read through verse 7. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By, by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Jesus Christ. Boy, I love those verses. That's, that's some of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. So the grace of God. While mercy is God withholding from us what we deserve, we just learned that, God's grace is giving to us what we don't deserve. So God's mercy is withholding from us what we don't deserve, but God's grace is giving to us what we do not deserve, which is his love. We do not deserve the love of God. And yet, he has shown us his love. God's grace expressed through his love is what allows a sinner to be saved. A sinner cannot earn God's love. But God chooses to love sinners. He chooses to love you. <laughs> hey, he, cho he chose to love me. And that's big because I was, a, I was a bad sinner. I was far from God. But he chose to love me. In doing so, he offers us the gift of salvation. So uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Let's, let's read those verses about the gift of God. By grace you've been saved and raised us up with him, seating us uh, with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Here in these two verses we read that salvation is called the gift of God. Now y'all heard me talk about this before, but when you think about a gift, there are two aspects for us to remember about a gift. Okay, number one, 
gifts are purchased by the giver. Okay? Gifts are purchased by the giver. Um, with money that is earned by the giver. Okay? So if I'm going to buy you a gift, I don't go to you and ask you to give me the money to go buy you a gift and come give it to you. No. I take my money and I go to the store and I buy something and I give it to you as a gift and you didn't have to do anything to get it. So gifts are purchased by the giver. Number two, gifts are free to the receiver. Okay? I, when I give you a Christmas gift, I don't walk up to you with it wrapped and all pretty with a bow on top and say, okay, if you give me a gift, I'll give you a gift. Or if you'll come mow my grass, you can have this gift. Can you tell what it is? This, it's yours. I'll give you three guesses. You got to earn it, but you can have it if you earn it. No, it wouldn't be a gift. That would be payment for something you did to earn it, right? That's not a gift. Gifts are purchased by the giver, and they're free to the receiver. According to verse 8, salvation is a gift. And according to verse 9, you cannot earn salvation. You can't pay for it. You can't work for it. It's a gift. The gift of salvation was purchased by God. So how much did this uh, gift of salvation cost? Remember, it didn't cost us. It cost God. This gift cost you nothing. But this gift cost, cost Jesus Christ, God's Son, his life. He shed his blood on the cross to pay for your sin and my sin. So how do you receive God's gift of salvation? Well, verse 8 said that you receive this gift by, of grace through faith. You see, God's, uh, by God's grace, he offers you this gift that you don't deserve, but see, you must receive it through faith. What is faith? Faith is believing in God and believing that what God says is true. Listen, the answer to man's sinfulness is God's compassion. See, you're born broken, but you're not forsaken. God in his compassion makes eternal life available to you. But the last color that Paul uses to complete the great portrait of salvation is the color green, which represents the forgiven man. So let's talk about forgiven man. We're going to get our Bible dot is out again, and we're going to move on down to verse 10 in Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 10. Finish it all out here. For we are his workmanship. That's God's. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in him in them. So the color green has always been like a, a, a symbol of the color of growth, right? You think of uh, grass and plants and trees when you think of the color green. So when a person understands their sinful condition, that's number one, repents, number two, and believes on Jesus Christ as Savior, that's step three in salvation, their spiritual life in Christ begins at that point. At that point, you are born spiritually. You are spiritually brought to life by the Spirit of God. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, but you trusted Christ as Savior, and you've been made alive by that faith in His Spirit. So according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, you are now referred to as His workmanship. In other words, you're God's masterpiece. It's like the masterpiece, the Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci. God created you. He formed you. 
And he designed you with the stroke of his love and perfection. And he has placed you on display to display his son to all the world. You are not broken. Excuse me. You are born broken, but you are not forsaken. You now have a purpose. Upon the time of salvation, now your life has a purpose because of the new life that you have. You are a masterpiece that God is creating to accomplish his purpose and will on this earth. You have been created in Christ, recreated in Christ to do good works. See, a, a lot of people think that they can just say that, that this little sinner's prayer and they're good to go and they're on their way to heaven and boom, that's the end. But see, no, they, they don't read, they take excerpts of the scripture and they don't read all of the scripture. You are not saved by good works, but now that you're saved, he has good works for you to do. See, you have been recreated in Christ to do good works. God wants you to put his son on display through your life and grow in him. That's, that's the green. We have to, um, it's not that we have to, but we get to. And, and once salvation is received by us, there is a desire that the Holy Spirit places inside of us to do those good works. And if, if the result of salvation did, has not resulted in good works by you, maybe you just didn't understand that. Maybe, maybe that wasn't taught to you. Um, see, there was a, a point in Scripture that Paul went to a church somewhere, and he said, uh, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And they said, what are you talking about? We, nobody's taught us about the Holy Spirit. And so then he prayed for them, and they received the Holy Spirit. You see, in order to be able to function properly in your salvation, you've got to know the benefits of salvation, and you have to learn how to function in your salvation. And I'm teaching you tonight that the green part of this portrait of salvation and God's grace and forgiveness is the fact that the salvation experience does not stop when you say that prayer or when you repent. It goes on and on and on and like the green grass and trees and plants grow and show forth their greatness, we do the same when we receive God's salvation. So I hope that this lesson has helped you tonight. I hope you've heard what the Spirit of God is trying to teach us tonight. I hope that, that every time you see a picture or a painting or, or green grass or trees or a beautiful flower or the color black or the color red, that that will remind you of what we've learned tonight. The great picture of God's salvation, His grace, His mercy, His forgiveness, and the fact that you used to be here, but you received here, and you got there. And that every day is a progression in your life to follow Christ and to show this beautiful portrait of salvation in your life and put it on display that others can also see the beautiful portrait of salvation that Paul painted for us in the words of Scripture. I love y'all. Thank you again for listening to the lessons and, and uh, doing your best to grow in Christ. I hope you're all reading your word daily and praying daily. If you haven't been doing that, I urge you today to get down on your knees tonight before you go to bed and pray. Talk to God. Ask him to help you in your life. Thank him for the salvation that he's given you. Thank him that, that you're no longer in darkness. But because of salvation, you're growing as a Christian. And ask him to help you through the power of the Holy Spirit. Because that's one of the reasons that uh, Christ sent the Holy Spirit in our lives, to help us grow. 
and to help us put him on display and to remind us of the things that salvation uh, should and, and our life should prove about our salvation. So spend time with God tonight. Read your word. Talk to him. Listen to him. Let him talk back to you. And let me know if I can help you in any way. I miss y'all. I love y'all. Me and Miss Rebecca are praying for y'all. And uh, we hope to see you soon. Love y'all.